Okay, hi everyone. I'll try and get onto it quickly because I think um, we're always catching up on time. Um, I'm Diana Morton. I'm Outreach and Access Manager with Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. And there were supposed to be two of us here today, but sadly Lynn's away at a funeral, so can't attend. Um, so just imagine I'm half of a double act and I'm going to switch halfway through. I've got her notes, so hopefully I'll do them some justice. Um, hopefully it'll work out and you'll just have to pretend it's her speaking, not me. Um, but to start off, off um, a bit about the project I want to talk about. Um, Respect Caribbean Life in Edinburgh was a part of Exchange, which was another AHRC funded project. Um, and we were one of sort of many sort of spoke museums that were funded through the sort of uh, main partner museums, National Museums of Scotland and Royal Museums Greenwich. And the aim of all these projects was to explore legacies of empire, migration and life in Britain um, through community-led collections research. And we worked with Edinburgh Caribbean Association to develop an exhibition, a film and a Spotify playlist exploring experiences of Caribbean communities in Edinburgh, which accumulated at the exhibition at the Museum of Edinburgh. And this was quite a timely project for us in that we had already be started looking at work around anti-racism and decolonisation. In 2020, in response to the Black Lives Matter protest, Museums Galleries Edinburgh had put out an anti-racism pledge. We started collecting material related to Black Lives Matter and we would set up an inclusion group, developing our EDI programmes more generally. So this work was a clear priority for us. Although, as I'll explain, and I think as um, so Cambridge Museum said earlier as well, this work's never done. This is a work in progress. It's not a finished product by any means. Um, and we were very lucky, obviously, that this project came with considerable amounts of funding that enabled us to do things like pay participants, which normally when we've got really tight budgets isn't something we can do. And the timeline was quite tight for this project. We had six months to develop and deliver it, which we did run over. But as I'll explain, um, this project was one where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Uh, <laughs> It's one of the ones that if I'm asked at any future job interview, can you give an example of a time when something went wrong? It'll be this project will be the one I'll talk about. We had, um, you know, um, COVID restrictions. We had inconveniently timed COVID infections. We had collapsing roofs. The Queen died the week of the opening. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was just a catalogue. But anyway, um, we did learn lots of things from this project and it's been a really sort of transformational project for us. So um, I will talk a bit about some of that stuff as we go on. So the plan for the project and what actually happened were slightly different. Um, so Edinburgh Caribbean Association was suggested to us as a project partner and we'd never worked with them before. Now, normally when I'm developing community engagement work, I would get to know the partners, run a couple of pilot projects, you know, have discussions with them before looking at going for a big funding um, project and developing something larger. So this was slightly different from how I'd normally do things. But we had obviously lots of discussions with Lisa Williams, um, who was the founder of Edinburgh Caribbean Association to develop ideas and we decided to look at the Museum of Childhood Collections. Now for context, this is late 2021. We still have COVID restrictions. We still have everything online. And at this point, we don't have permission to work in person with community groups at all. Um, so all of, some of our venues are still shut. So we did what everyone would do at the time, which was set up some Zoom sessions. And with hindsight, this is not a very good way to start a project like this. Um, it was the only option at the time, but we were, the group didn't know us. It was a weekday evening. Everyone was at home with their families. Some people trying to cook meals, supervise homework. And then we pop up on everyone's screen going, hey, let's work with the museums. And I think, you know, some of the group were really open and honest with us. They told us their voices weren't heard in cultural spaces. We started discussing institutional racism and the biases of curators and collectors. And they flagged to us, it was really important to factor in emotional support as a part of this project and to involve people of so Caribbean heritage facilitating some of these discussions as well. But the group were clear they really wanted to get involved and visit museums and to get involved with the project. So we put in our funding proposal in February and st started a project in February rather with another Zoom session, which at which point we realised that was not working at all for the group. And this was one of the very first groups we got permission to work with in person 
after the lockdowns, um, purely because we, it was such a priority for us getting this up and running. Um, and so this is when it started really coming to life. So these pictures, this is actually the picture on the left is the first session we ever did with the group in person at the City Arts Centre. And we just got out loads of object handling collections and everyone just, we played with toys, we had sort of a bit of a laugh and it actually is when things started coming together. We had lovely Caribbean food and things started to gel. And this is the point where, yeah, things started to work out for us. So we had sessions at the Museum of Childhood, the Museum of Edinburgh, visiting the exhibition spaces and discussing ideas. And it was actually the session, you can see a picture of in the middle. This is Renuka, who's one of the group participants. And at this session, she'd brought in a load of objects she remembered from her childhood. Um, she had sweets from the Caribbean that she started passing around everyone and letting them taste. She had objects that she remembered from her home. And I think this is the point we're thinking, this is coming together. People are taking ownership of this and really feeling engaged in this at that point. And you can see some of the objects that she brought in and some of the rest of the group brought in on display in the exhibition, actually, in that end picture. So some of these discussions came together to create that exhibition. Now, working in person obviously was not without its issues at this point. Um, pretty much everyone ended up isolating or actually ill with COVID. Um, we found out there was issues with the ceilings at the Museum of Childhood. So our plan to have an exhibition in that space was not going to happen. We had to move the exhibition down the road to the Museum of Edinburgh instead. Um, and we found that the group, it was tricky sometimes that they have very busy lives. They had a lot of other things on and other commitments. So we were working at evenings and weekends and people couldn't make every session. And it was also a very mixed age groups. So we had children, we had adults. So we were trying to pitch things for suit everyone. So obviously that could have been quite tricky at times. Um, one of the things we were really keen to make sure about this project that we were being obviously working in a participatory way, but also creating safer spaces. I say safer rather than safe because I think safe spaces as such can be quite tricky. So sort of create. But one of the things we did with the sessions, we generally provided Caribbean food and drink to make people feel at home. We paid participants for their time. Now we did this in vouchers, which is obviously not always ideal. Sometimes people probably prefer to be paid. This was mainly to avoid having to go through the rigmarole of putting people on payroll and checking they're self-employed and things like that. Um, we also paid Lisa from Edinburgh Caribbean Association, who's there in the middle. We paid her for a time on the project and it was her, Lynn, who can't be here, the curator and myself who were sort of core team running the project. We also paid Charmaine Pollard, who is a poetry therapist, and she ran poetry therapy sessions on Zoom for the group to provide emotional support because some of the topics we were discussing obviously were quite difficult. And to start with, we went along to some of these sessions, but we soon realised that actually, as the museum representatives, maybe it would be better if we just left the group to sort of have those discussions without us being present in case we were sort of inhibiting those discussions. Now, these, this was actually cited as a sort of example of best practice in terms of the final report that National Museums of Scotland put out about the project. However, soon after publication, we were contacted by a journalist at The Telegraph um, who wrote this wildly inaccurate article um, suggesting that all the museum staff were woke snowflakes who needed therapy for dealing with life in Britain, um, which really illustrates that the nastiness of the culture wars and that providing emotional support for participants can be quite a radical act in some ways and also brought home the sort of, um, the sort of negativity that some groups can face in our society really brought that home to us as well. Alongside obviously things like this, we also had things like training for staff and anti-racism, ensuring front of house staff were briefed in terms of managing visitors to the exhibition, what to do if they found racist comments and things like that in our exhibition space as well. Um, in terms of the process for developing the exhibition, um, we wanted to make sure it was very much discussion based and steered by the group. And the group really wanted to focus on the sort of positive contributions of Caribbean communities and not histories of oppression. So we thought that was actually, that's what we focused on. And we had a lot of ideas, but I think interesting University of Cambridge Museums talked about this, about providing structure for your sessions. I think sometimes we struggled with how you balance the structuring the sessions and not taking control of the sessions ourselves. Um, so often the group would come up with ideas as a group and then we would sort of narrow down 
the sort of session, dammy down these ideas as a sort of core team and then put that back to the group to sort of sign off. So an example of that is the um, logo up there, which the group came up with concepts for. Then um, the sort of core team, Lisa Lynn and myself, sort of went to our designer and sort of arranged a sort of draft version of this. Then that got sent by WhatsApp to all the groups, all the groups, so they could feed back on it. Then the feedback came back to us, and then we passed it to the designer. So as you can imagine, this is quite a time-consuming process. This isn't just one person making a decision. This is everyone involved in that decision-making process. And I think that's one of the things, if anyone was running a similar project, I think factor in extra time for that sort of group decision-making process to take place. Um, now, one of the other things the group really keen on was about sort of illustrating the vibrancy of Caribbean culture. So we've obviously got a very brightly coloured logo, but some of the other things we wanted was um, to bring that to life and not have a static exhibition. So we had a film where the group talked about their experiences of growing up in the Caribbean and obviously that put the people into the exhibition so it wasn't just objects. And we also have a Spotify playlist which you could access by QR code in the exhibitions again to bring the sort of music and cultural life um, into the exhibition so it wasn't just something static and still. The final exhibition um, was at the Museum of Edinburgh and it contained museum collections, but also material collected for the project and also items loaned by the group themselves. So we've got books here loaned by one of the group participants, um, which explore sort of Hindu um, sort of stories. Um, and I think one of the things that I ignorantly at the start of the project didn't realise there's actually quite large sort of Indian and Chinese communities in the Caribbean, um, which we really want to illustrate that in the exhibition. The middle image is, um, shows an artwork called Contributions by Shane Alex Diocesro and he's a Caribbean artist and he made this artwork showing um, Caribbean flags and it's called Contributions, um, look at the contributions of the Windrush generation and alongside that we've got um, war records from the group participants um, of some of their family members, again sort of showing those contributions. And on the end, we've got Caribbean food and drink. And that cabinet, where I opened it to deinstall the exhibition, the smell was amazing. <laughs> All these herbs and spices and things like that. Um, so, one of the things that I might move on to talk about, this was going to be Lynn's bit, so hopefully I will um, give this some justice, um, was about collections practice and the impact this had on our collections based practice. So, I'm going to show you some very creepy dolls. <laughs> so, I, just to sort of go through some of the stuff that Lynn really wanted to say here was about this is the very early stages of our work to change practice and implement changes in our work. And we've already made some changes, but this job is not done. And actually, this work is never going to be done and should never be done. And it's OK to feel there's more to do to make ourselves more inclusive and representative. And it's better to learn and review our practice rather than stagnate. And I think it's better to have an open mind and not be afraid to say that we got things wrong. And we need to be open to ideas, suggestions and differences of opinion. And I think obviously the sector has been talking a lot more about sort of decolonisation, how we can become more representative. And what we're talking today is just one practice and the impact it's had on our organisation. And there's lots of great other examples out there. So just to put that in that context. So when we applied for project funding and agreed to be part of the wider exchange partnership, we were going to look at the Museum of Childhood book collection. The childhood collection has a lot of objects that reflect empire and attitudes towards race in other, other countries. And the bulk of the collection comes from the late 19th and early 20th century. And so obviously corresponds with the attitudes of the time. And we naively thought we'd work with ECA, do some decolonisation research and hadn't really thought about the process that that would look like. And I think we got, Lynn brought Lisa in to look at the stores and look at the book collections. And I think at this point it became really obvious that we just spent the entire project looking at all the racist and offensive things within our collections. It was going to be a very depressing project, but also we weren't going to get the public facing outputs that we really wanted to get out of this as well. And I think it's something that sounds obvious now, but the heavy lifting to deal with what's in our collections should not be the responsibility of the community groups we work with. It should be our responsibility as the museum professionals. And we should be for our local communities. We should be providing opportunities to learn and enjoy and participate. And 
the community groups we work with should not have to do that hard labour for us. And I think this was the first lesson we learned was about how to provide how to provide resources and embed this type of anti-racism and decolonisation work in our practice. We were doing this to an extent, but this visit to the stores um, that Lynn took Lisa on really brought this home about our responsibilities and really highlighted the importance of agreeing mutual goals at the start of the project. So to proceed, we decided to look at Caribbean culture, Caribbean childhoods, and to see what was represented in the collection. And we we're gonna celebrate Caribbean life. And this wasn't just a museum project, researching people's lives and experiences, it's personal, and it was gonna have an emotional impact. And one participant said, it will be an emotional journey. We should think very carefully about how we're gonna manage these emotions that come on and how we're gonna support each other because it's gonna start digging off stuff that unhealed. And so we used some of the budget, as I mentioned, for a poetry therapist. And the feedback from this was very important. I think that's something we'd take forward is how we support people when we're having these conversations. And for one workshop, we took the group to the Museum of Childhood to look at the displays and talked about how to write labels and develop displays. And one comment that stays with us the most is, I don't see myself here. As you can see, there is a doll gallery with lots of creepy white doll faces. And um, basically, this wasn't representative of the people we're working with. And the Museum of Childhood has a lot of dolls from you know, all over the world, but there's souvenir costume dolls or ethnographic dolls with questionable incorrect labels or no labels at all. And this display was created in 1986 and it's been updated little since then. And one of the things that actually Lynn started looking at was what else is in the collections that isn't on display here? And actually, it turns out we did have items in the collections that were more representative. They just weren't on display. They were shoved in a cupboard somewhere. Um, and this was something we found. So we found um, we had a Caribbean ABC. Um, we found out that we had a book of African stories. We had this black doll that we think was donated by American and dates from about the 1840s. We have very little information about her um, or you know the background um, for her, but we found these items and found that there actually were things in store. We also bought new items for the collections as well. So this is just some of the items that were purchased for the displays. Things like um, brown skin Barbies, Coco magazine, sports magazine, and new books that we added to the collections as well. So in terms of the legacies of this project, obviously we got some really positive feedback from both the group and visitors to the exhibition. Um, we had a sort of um, post-it wall in the exhibition where people added their comments. And these were some of the comments that came back via the exhibition. Um, uh, the people talked about how it made them feel seen or representative, which is obviously the opposite of that comment, I don't see myself here, that was really positive for us. And some people did flag things that they said, oh, you haven't told this story. For instance, the story about the um, Chinese indentured labor. And, Yes, fair enough, we'll hold our hands up. There are stories we've missed out for these, this exhibition or not told as well. Um, but it was really positive to see people feel that this represented them. I love this comment about um, the Vicks vapour rub made me feel very seen. Uh, so there's some really nice feedback in there. Um, so some of the other outcomes of this was we had a large public programme which showcased Caribbean people's skills, things like yoga, storytelling, cooking and talks and everyone was paid for their time for those activities. And again, this is something that we haven't always historically done. We've not always had the budgets to do this, um, but I think that's something that's come out as very important. We also have a planned Windrush event in June for Windrush 75, and also a legacy project planned around sort of creative writing. So yeah, keep your eyes out for that. That'll be coming, coming soon. And Obviously, we've had an impact on the collection. They've made some changes to the dolls gallery already, um, removing the ethnographic dolls. And we start to have more representative examples from the collections in a couple of the displays. And discussions with the group made us question how we described objects in our database. For example, we described dolls with pink colored do bodies as dolls, but dolls with brown colored bodies are described as black dolls. Why do we not describe the pink dolls as pink dolls. And this is immediately othering those dolls that aren't pink. Um, and so, so we look at terminology, and this is a huge area where stereotypes and unconscious bias are showing themselves. 
Also, there's racist language used in some of the objects themselves, for instance, some of the titles of books. And this is an issue about how do you then describe these items in a way that will you know, protect people coming into those sort of spaces and working with those collections. Um, and this is something we're working on currently, but working with the ECA enables us to have different perspective and opened our eyes to these biases that we'd previously been blind to. And during this project, we also hosted a paid postgraduate internship with funding from SGSAH. And we had PhD student Sam Cheney reviewing the book collection, and he's made a report of our recommendations. And we're going to use this to implement changes in our documentation and displays. And it's quite helpful because he was neither a community participant or museum staff, so he brought in a different perspective into this work. And Many organisations have warnings about racist language or images in their publicly accessible catalogues. And our catalogue is not online yet, but we're working towards that. And obviously we're going, we want to have a disclaimer or something there to warn people about the content of this material. And in the meantime, obviously, how do we protect people from these things in our stores and archives? And this is something under discussion, but Lynn has already grouped together certain items and labelled them within the stores. So there is some sort of content warning about that material that is there. And I think for future acquisitions, projects, displays, community work, we need to ask ourselves who is being represented? What is and isn't being displayed and uh, being displayed and acquired? And what do our displays, resources and catalogues show? And what biases are there that we're just blindly ignoring? Um, and I think sometimes this work can be resource heavy, but I think this is something we can approach strategically, but also chip away at and make small changes where we possibly can. Sometimes this work doesn't need to be huge projects. It can be tweaking things here and there. For example, I'm looking at our loan box collections right now and looking, well, we've got all this material that links to sort of stories of empire that is being sort of given out, but without questioning why the stuff's there and why we have this stuff. So these are small changes that we can make. And I think Museums Gallows Edinburgh, we have still have lots of work to do, but some changes have already been made. And by working openly and honestly with the Edinburgh Caribbean Association, it's given us momentum to continue this work and hopefully have some longer lasting impact. And so we can lead to further work around sort of anti-racism, decolonisation. And we do have um, sort of wider inclusion group for our museum service. We have our EDI plan that's now um, going to committee fairly soon. So we have a sort of ongoing work um, and a sort of more strategic level that's happening around this as well. And finally, um, I'd like to thank Edinburgh Caribbean Association for their time, creativity and experience and for their generosity in working with us and introducing us and the wider public to the sort of vibrant um, heritage of the Caribbean as well. Um, and it's been wonderful working with them. Um, just to finish up, if you do want to get in touch with Mia Lynn, this was a picture we were taking, this was during the filming, and Mia Lynn were just messing around. This is Lisa's globe that is now on my desk because she says she doesn't want it back. I haven't stolen it. Um, um, so yeah, if you want to get in touch, feel free to get in touch with us, or obviously if you want to ask any questions now, great. But if you'd rather not, then yeah, just message, message as well. Thank you.